Lee, I'm now joined in our panel by John Lyons, Labour TD, who's also Vice Chair of the Oireachtas Committee in Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, by Professor Alan Barrett from the ESRI, from my, on my right-hand side by Moira Murphy, who from the We're Not Leaving campaign, and by Councillor Hugh Lewis from People Before Profit. First of all, starting with you, John Lyons, a number of people in George's film said the 100 euro dole cut, it hasn't incentivised the guys to go out and get work because frankly it's not there, but it's left them with hardly any money at all to find work, to print CVs, and they're totally dependent on their parents if they're living at home. I mean, firstly, Miriam, I wouldn't disagree with anybody saying that 100 euros is difficult to live on, and, um, and I know that firsthand from many of the people in my own area in Ballymun and Finglas, but at the same time, I don't think it, it's acceptable to have such a high level of youth unemployment in Ireland, and that's one of the reasons why during the European uh, presidency, the Irish presidency of the European Union, that uh, we uh, ensured that uh, the youth guarantee, which is that concept of developing a guarantee for young people who are out of work, that they will be, they will be offered within a, within, a, within a period of being out of work, um, um, you know, sufficient education and training in order to, you know, be more job ready or please God take up some of those jobs. And I promise to come to back to that, John. But the 100 euro for the moment on the dollar, I just want to stick with that sure. for a moment. I mean, a number of the people who spoke to George there, and I'm sure it's right across the country, they're saying that cut is actually going to backfire because the government did it, A, not to keep young people on the dole, and B, to help them get jobs. But it's actually having the opposite effect because they simply can't afford to go out and get jobs. Yeah, f firstly, the, the, the actual uh, cut that, uh, that, you know, that, that we're speaking about uh, doesn't actually come into effect until January 2014. For new entrants, that, that's not to say that there wasn't one there since before this government came in. But yes, that is the reality. But also the reality, Miriam, is that um, you know, there are finite resources out there at the moment. And you know, uh, John Burton says today on, on the news at one that the reality is the, the savings that will be made from the reduction for new uh, LM unemployment employed people from 2014 um, is, is uh, you know, is, is being twice as much as being spent on, um, on initiatives and to ensure that there is further education and training places for them. So, I mean... But you're not suggesting, of course, John, you're not, that the people in the original dough before the cut were ha quite happy to settle not with that and weren't far, out seeking far, jobs? Far from it at all, Miriam. I, I do not, and I wouldn't disagree with the fact that 100 euros for anybody is mm. difficult to live on. But there are finite resources, and a decision was made that with finite resources, do we put some of that which what other countries that have best practice around low youth unemployment rates they've put that some of that money into actually developing services for people in order to ensure that they may have a better opportunity of taking up and jobs. And yes I realise the cuts have to be equally distributed but even George pointed out there in his film like this group of the under 25s they seem to be overwhelmingly affected more than any other groups in our society. I mean the, the reality and research shows this uh, you know that during during bus times young people in particular are, mm. are affected most by unemployment and um, equally then, you know, I suppose as the economy is returning a little bit back towards where, where it was, where 3,000 jobs a month are being created compared to 8,000 when, when we're being lost when we took office, that, um, you know, there are small signs of people coming back to work, particularly young people as okay. well. Let me bring in Moira Murphy, you're from County Clare. What's the name of the village you're from, by the way? Kilshani. You're one this came, We're Not Leaving campaign. First of all, tell me about that and then I'll get you to react to John. Yeah, well, the We're Not Leaving campaign was a recently set up campaign and um, just actually last weekend we had a Young People's Assembly where many, many young people came together to address the youth crisis that's currently existing in Ireland. And one of the big things that we are campaigning on is youth unemployment and its relationship with forced emigration um, in particular. So um, over the weekend we formulated a set of demands and one of the demands was that the, the government um, must actually create meaningful real jobs for the economy not the kind of training courses that they're claiming will actually help people get jobs which simply don't exist. On the dole cut how much do you think that has impacted on people under 25 trying to get jobs? Well obviously it hasn't impacted yet but I mean Already as it exists, there is age discrimination within the dole cuts. I mean, people from the age of 18 to 21 already are only living on 100 euro a week, which is entirely unacceptable. Nobody should be forced to do that. The way that the government justifies this is to perpetuate a myth about uh, welfare culture, that young people are just sitting at home uh, watching their mm. flat screen TVs, which is what Eamon Gilmore said only a few weeks ago, which is ludicrous. So the justification for these training schemes is that it'll somehow provide an impetus for young people to get out there and and get confident and get these jobs, but uh, that that's simply not not possible. I mean, we see here. Um at the same time that there are these training schemes, there's also uh, student fees being increased, and at the same time there's introduction for registration fees for apprentices. So you would question what the government is really doing here. 
Alan Barrett, economists love incentives. You often all talk about incentives. This was meant to incentivize, I suppose, young people to get off the dole and to go and find work or to rely on less money. Will it work? If, if there's no job out there, will it work? Uh, no, probably not. Um, I mean, just one point on, on the principle of this. It does seem that one of the principles here is that, in some sense, younger people have uh, lower living costs, and as a result, it, you know, you, you can cut their dole. Um, I'm not necessarily saying I was against this. I mean, we have a fiscal crisis, and you know, I think if, if you're going to start cu complaining about cuts, you have to say, well, where else would the cuts have come? But on this specific one, I mean, for a long time in Ireland, we paid women less, and the argument was, in some sense, oh well, women had, you know, they didn't have families to bring up or whatever, like at least they weren't the breadwinner. Now we we abandoned that notion a very, very long time ago. We generally Actually. treat all adults equally, so I just did think that mm. was a bit strange. In terms of the incentive effect, no, it probably won't work uh, for the simple reason that really the, the youth unemployment crisis, we can call it that, but it's still just the economic crisis. Okay, it is still fundamentally the problem that we don't have enough jobs to go around and like ultimately the thing we really need to do is to get the economy starting to move and when that happens the hope will be of course that jobs will come around and that young people will be in a position to get those jobs but having said that I think one of the great great fears and worries that we have is that we know the longer people are out of work the more difficult it is for them to get back into work mm. so we have at the moment we have this current problem of youth unemployment but wh where we're really worried about it is that even if things turn around it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to plug back in seamlessly and what we also know is that even if people get jobs one of the worst things about sort of entering the labor market at the time of a recession is it can actually affect you for the rest of your career it's the okay. scarring, it's, the scarring about, effect. It? it's not necessarily the case that you're going to you know jump back to where you otherwise would have been mm -hmm. you can now spend the entire of your life behind where you otherwise would have been and this is why we worried about youth unemployment I mean there's middle-aged unemployment there's elderly unemployment mm -hmm. but there's a, a specific worry about youth unemployment because it can affect people essentially for the rest of their life you know, it's on that dull um, cut, which we'll now move off in a moment. But I suppose the idea, Michael Noon on the night of the budget felt that it's bad to leave people on the dole for too young, especially young people. And if you can incentivise them to get off it, that's a good thing. Can you see where and um, why he made that decision? Well, of, of course that would be a good thing if the incentive was to get a job. But the problem is that there are no jobs uh, in our society. So how do you incentivise people to actually get jobs? Do you incentivise... Uh, the employer to provide the jobs or do you slash social welfare uh, in a society where there aren't jobs in the first place so you know the idea and the narrative put uh, forward by John and his government <coughs> that somehow slashing social welfare will incentivize people to, to get to work is discriminatory against young people uh, and it's a very negative attitude towards young people uh, as if they want to stay at home you know the facts are there during the uh, height of our uh, economic success in this country young people were at work when there was jobs there young people were passionate uh, and were out working they weren't sitting home watching flat screen TVs uh, as being uh, put across and also the evidence is there if young people are uh, ready to and take the big step to emigrate out of this country then what else are they looking for only for work and they're doing it in their droves and in their thousands and they'll continue to do it if the policies of the government uh, carry forward. C can I just say just very quickly there Miriam, you know I've grown up in Valley 1, I still live there, chose as an adult to make that my home as well. There are people in the area that I represent who live in second generation jobless households. So there are young people who I went to, who I actually taught in school out in the area as well, who have never had a parent or a, a, a sibling in their family ever go to work. Now I want options for those people, I want them to be first of all equipped to take up jobs that are coming on and and you it is wrong to say that there are no well, jobs being created the fact is I mean not we got to deal in facts when we're talking about such a sensitive issue there are 3,000 jobs as we know a month being created as opposed to 8,000 being lost yeah, a month yeah. when we came in well, so there are jobs being created well, and we have to be fair on that and it's important yeah. to ensure particularly yeah. given the the you know the wage scare and the other effects that are given to young people in particular as opposed to other people who are unemployed that we ensure that they are not left behind okay, you come on. well let's deal with the facts a thousand uh, people are are emigrating out of this country every week and John I'm from uh, as much a working class sure. community sure. in Ballybrack as yourself and the vast majority of households uh, in Ballybrack, in Ballymun or for, for uh, any working class area for example did work and have worked for the last uh, so many generations. It's the, the vast vast majority will work when the jobs are there and Absolutely. they want to be working uh, but the, precisely the people that aren't working in our communities uh, the people I meet every day of the week to tell me they're, they're heading off in a couple of weeks because they can't find work are construction workers and people who used to work in the construction industry <laughs> led into the industry by the government and are now uh, failing miserably 
uh, to deal with these people. And you know, it's an awful shame because construction workers, of all people, could actually be uh, put to work. There could be good public enterprises if the government so chose so. And of course, we have, of course, we have finite resources. Uh, but it's a political choice where we put our resources. Do we put our resources into banks, for example, nine billion uh, in interest payments? The same budget we're spending on education. So. Where do we funnel the money? Do we recognise young people or do we recognise I just want to system? bring Niamh Randall in, in my audience there. You're from Simon Niamh and I know on a daily basis, on a practical level, you're actually seeing the impact of that dole cut and what it can mean for people for the future. I suppose specifically what we're concerned about in the Simon communities of Ireland are very vulnerable young people and particularly this social welfare cut is going to have a real impact on vulnerable young people causing homelessness in the first place but actually also preventing young people from moving out of homelessness because they actually can't afford to do so and we did see that with the 2009 welfare cuts so the evidence is there to support that so I think these changes make an awful lot of assumptions that young people live in their family home that they can live in the family home that the family can afford to support them and we heard Leon speaking about that on the video there where he spoke about the pressure on a large family. So there's a number of assumptions made there but I also think that we see two arms of the state, state effectively working against one another where there's a commitment to end long-term homelessness by 2016 yet another arm of the state is actually making decisions and implementing policy which might cause homelessness yeah. to happen in the first place but also prevent people moving out of homelessness. Fair point actually yes. Yeah. To move on a little bit from that dole cut to these training courses you're all talking about, the training guarantee as the government talks about, I mean is it practical to believe, John Lyons, that you can come up with hundreds of thousands of these training schemes that are going to teach young people the kind of skills that will get them the kind of IT jobs they need in Google, Facebook, or even the kind of skill they need to be a top level chef. I mean, what are these training courses going to teach them? Well, well I mean, first of all, there are existing training courses and an announcement was made, uh, made in line with delivering or rolling out the Youth Guarantee from 24, January 2014 onwards that additional places will be made available. Um, there's 20,000 additional places on top of the ones that are already there, particularly for young people. I mean, there's no shortage of, of, of you know, education and training courses and work placements. courses, John? Well, if we, take, if, we take, if we take Job Bridge, and you know, and there, there'll be people on this panel who'll be ready to fire back and say that it's all sorts of other things, but we got a deal in facts. And the fact is, from two independent reports, that three out of five people who complete Job Bridge end up in full-time employment. Now, we may not like some of, the, some of, some of the, the reasons why people have to do Job Bridge, but the fact is, it is giving people full-time employment employment and when we are limited by resources we have to be innovative in our approaches to ensure that people you know take up jobs that well, are there. I'll come back to Jobbridge but on training courses I mean are you going to train these young people are you just going to give them false hope that the training they're going to get will get them a good solid job are they just pointless training courses? No not at all for example I take the IT sector there's approximately 4,000 jobs in the IT sector um, according to FIT Fast Track to IT who actually have a speciality in working with long-term unemployed people from disadvantaged areas and they have spoken to the Microsofts of this world, the semantics of this world and so on, who said if you can get the people upskilled, which is through the Momentum, the momentum Initiative, which is a short-term upskilling of people into jobs that will be available in the IT sector that some of the biggest companies in Ireland refuse to actually you know, uh, take on until they have people trained. So what I'm saying is there is no shortage on ideas. There are sectors of the, of the economy that are growing and there are people within those sectors that are willing to take on More. people but we don't even have some of those people trained. Yeah, uh, just on the job bridge thing, because um, I know you mentioned the statistics about the people who can mm. who get placements afterwards. That full time employment full afterwards. Full time employment afterwards. Mm. But um, though that statistic is, is just taken from anybody who was on that job bridge scheme at any point afterwards, any job that they get. And the, the government is making a link between that and, and the job. So that, that in itself is skewing, <laughs> skewing the fact. And also, um, in fact, it, uh, just, just to put it out there, I mean, what Jobbridge is, it's a free labour scheme where people are working for 50 euro extra on top of what now, if you take in the dole code of 100 euro. So you're working yeah. for 150 euro. If that's an average 35 hour mm. week, you are earning 3.85 euro an hour. That's much less than, yeah. I mean, that, how is that acceptable? That, that's just... Hey, man, yeah. and I bring you both I, in. You know, the one thing we all have in common here tonight is that we genuinely are concerned around Good question people. for more, though. And um, the reality is, you know, 
the people who've done Job Bridge are happy that they've done it. They, they wouldn't have, I'm sure, you know, if there were better options around, we wouldn't be pursuing such as Job Bridge. People are dropping but the reality, out of Job Bridge but the reality is, is we exactly. can't get away from the facts. Three out of five people who complete Job Bridge, and the, out of the two who didn't complete it, 60% of those who didn't complete it took up full time employment. So we've got to stick to the facts around this issue. But, John, is it not also bringing on that, you know, employers, of course, if they can get someone much cheaper, they're going to replace the person they have with someone on Job Bridge. Well, I, mean, I can only speak from the, the reports that have been done, Miriam, and that is that Job Bridge is one of the most successful internship programs within the EU. EU. And we best ask I'm people who have actually completed Job Bridge. In an ideal world, should we need it? Perhaps not. But we don't okay. live in an ideal world um, right now. Is it successful? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> You're um, an economist. You know everything. Well, I'll tell you why I don't know, which is at least mm. uh, getting us in, in some direction. No, I don't want to be overly negative. I mean, things like Job Bridge, I think, have a place, okay? Because, again, as we were discussing a few minutes ago, if people remain sort of too far from the labour market for too long, that scarring effect is a real, real worry. So schemes that at least, uh, you know, keep people in touch with the labour market are very important and they can be valuable. The problem with the statistic John mentions is that a certain proportion of those people probably would have got jobs anyway. I mean, you can say that, you know, 60% uh, of these folks got jobs because of the job bridge scheme. They got jobs, but they may well have got them anyway. So I think we really need mm -hmm. to be very, very sure. careful about that. But on the broader issue, okay, about you know quality courses or not, Train. we know from an awful lot of the ESRI research going on over the last 20 years, there are some good force courses that actually do work and get people, and there's a whole load of them that don't. You know, they're not effective. And there's a, a, a massive amount of research that really sort of points in the direction of the sort of things that need to be done, the, the, the way these things need to be designed. But of course, we know that FOSS has not been the, you know, the most successful organization in recent years. And that's what it's, we're going to do. Well, you changed the name on the building. Well, I mean, we also developed the further education <coughs> training uh, section, which is a revamping of our education right. training section to ensure that we you know we can train people to meet the supply and demand situation that will arise. I'll come back to you, Hugh. I just want to go to the audience. David Ryan, I know you're with Ogre, Fianna Fáil, but you've had your own experiences with training courses. There are certainly groups, meetings, when people were talking about their leaving cert. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was unlucky. I finished college, then I had to take the tumble on the door like everybody else does for the first few months. And um, one of the very, I have to say, in Leash, they were very, very good. We did have to go to meetings. And after three months, if you sit on the dole, you were brought in to give you tips and solutions on how to get a job. Um, I, I found there was people across all parts of society in there, which was, which was um, kind of a, a strange thing for me to take on. Um, with regards to, there was people all across society, basically people asking what you do if you failed your leave insert. You had people asking where's the best place to get English language courses. And then you had people like myself who'd done a master's in University of Limerick and were just basically waiting to get, get a good job. I mean, we had individual meetings afterwards and literally I was just told, look, you've done enough education, you've done enough, get out there. Um, and I mean, it was after those meetings where I was really so they weren't really tailored for you, is that what you're saying? No, they weren't, tailored, like, they weren't tailored at all. And I mean, once uh, it was literally, uh, you've done your education, just go. Um, and it was like, either get a job in Ireland or go abroad and get a job. Now, they didn't say it, and like, they wouldn't ever tell anybody to go abroad, but that's, that's what's happening. Um, I mean, with the, 100, with the drop to 100 euro, with the drop to 140, mm. it's, it's, it's really given people less and less options because they can't travel to and from. Um, from interviews. I mean, I'm from Port Leash. It's 20 euro return to Dublin. All the jobs are in Dublin. That's 20% of their weekly take on one interview in one week. So if they've got two or three, where does that leave them with regards to food, housing? I've marked pairing the audience. I know it's not quite training courses, but you're very pro job bridge, aren't you, Mark? Tell me your own experience. Um, we found out about a couple of months ago that this was happening and, we, and with the help that we got from them, we were able to employ a lot of people into full-time positions with our company. Um, I think going further uh, in the future, we'll be able to employ, uh, employ more people in our industry with the training and the backing from the jobs ridge. And what, I'm not talking about you, obviously, but yeah. what about the danger that employers, obviously, if you can get somebody cheaper, you might get rid of somebody full-time who's costing you more money and replace them with a cheap young person. No, these are new full-time positions. Okay. All right, there's, we're not letting anybody go for this reason. We are taking on new okay. staff for full-time positions. Mike McLaughlin from Youth Work Ireland. Um, are these courses good? Do you believe in them? 
Well, for start, uh, just to make clear, JobBridge is, is the evaluation report showed the majority of participants aren't young on JobBridge. So just for mm -hmm. a start, there you have it. There's a, 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 mm. an initiative people talk about all the time. It's helping young people, and the majority of participants aren't actually young. So there is a lot of problems with this, and, and the media reports today show that it looks like Ireland won't be able to get really anywhere near the type of c commitment and the level of provision that's needed to provide this youth guarantee, where people will get something after four months. So the department are pushing out to six months, maybe nine months. So really, uh, that's a big, big problem, and we, we've known for the last two years people are making submissions saying, Look, this is coming down the line, we have to have more provision for young people, mm -hmm. and it hasn't happened. And now we're kind of running around at the last minute trying to make it happen. So I think there's a long way to go. I think people are very cynical the fact that the, I think the government knew in advance of the budget that there wasn't enough education and training places, and yet they still went ahead uh, and cut the welfare rates for under 26s. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of people around the country trying to deliver service for young people uh, very cynical. Kate Lawler, I know you've got your own view on these kind of courses for young people as well, Kate, don't you? I, I do. Um, I started JobBridge in 2011 and I'm in full-time employment in the Irish Independent now um, and it helped me get my foot on the career ladder. Um, I completely, I'm in support of it. Um, I think it's a great scheme. Um, so for me, like, it, it worked out really well. Um, so, so you're proof. Basically, you're the like, proof that it does work. John, I mean, you've obviously booked her for the audience tonight. And I, 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 as well as everyone else, I found, yeah. it, I found it really hard to get work after I left college. And yeah. um, I did what I'm doing in the independent now isn't what I studied. So I was thinking of going back to college or you know paying yeah. for a course. But instead, I upskilled by doing JobBridge, and um, I managed to learn new skills uh, by going into it. And at the end, I was offered a job, and I'm now working there full-time and I absolutely love it. That's so great because it's great to hear yeah, great nice success hearing. stories. Grace Wales, what's your own experience, Grace? Okay, sorry, um, over here, I work in the Centre for the Unemployed in North Clondalkin. and yeah. I'm around long enough to remember the last yes, crisis that we had um, and I, I just think it's really unfair um, the way young people are being treated. And I do have a question in terms of when does a young person become an adult? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, because if you look at <clears throat> the report that George Lee referred to there. Mm. I mean, what I heard before was that, you know, this, the, the, the slashing of, of supports to young people was about incentivising them to take up jobs that are not there, to take up training that there just isn't enough of, um, and that it was about incentivising. But what George Lee referred to there in that report was that the government are saying now, which I only hear, hear now, is that, you know, parents are being forced now to look after their, their young unemployed mm -hmm. children. Now, I'm looking around the audience here and I don't see any children sitting in this audience. Mm -hmm. I see adults, young adults, yeah. young women, young men who are being absolutely demoralised by what, what, what has happened in this country. I have two children who are in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, five years ago, four years ago, when my son became employed, unemployed, um, he, had, he was nearing the end of a, a mechanic apprenticeship. And I remember going to um, a TD in my area, who was a junior minister at the time, and I asked him to please, please do something to ensure that there wasn't a crisis for young people. Don't allow young people to sit around. There was nothing done. And you referred to momentum. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong in terms of the length of qualifying period, but a lot of these programmes that you're referring to have qualifying periods, which means that the individuals going on those programmes have to actually sit on the dole for a certain length of time before they can access them. Okay, that doesn't make sense. To stick on immigration for a moment and then I'll bring you in here. I mean, what's your own view on immigration? You don't think it's the worst option for a young unemployed well, person, do you? Uh, let me be very, very clear okay. about this. I mean, forced immigration is a, is a, a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, this is one point where actually the, the recession has a very big impact on parents. I mean, we often talk about, you know, the, the recession, how it's impacted on young people. But I mean, parents suffer enormously when their kids go away. So the, I, I, I don't want to sort of belittle this or pretend it's not a, uh, a horrible issue. But the truth is, we've talked already about the, the dangers of being unemployed and staying unemployed for a very long time. And it's clear that that, is, that that has a very negative impact on your career prospects and, you know, throughout your life. By contrast, I mean, if you emigrate, you are at least staying connected to the labour market for a period of time. <laughs> And we know from a lot of research that actually your career possibilities can improve dramatically because you've worked away. So all I'm saying is from an individual perspective, okay. emigrating is, is probably a better economic decision, okay? But obviously life is about much more than economics. Quick comment from both of you. Absolutely, yeah. But, uh, just on the issue of jobs bridge, because John's made a lot of assertions there, and uh, that lady in the audience is an example of how an internship could work, but the reality of jobs bridge is starkly different. 75% of people that enter Jobsbridge do not finish Jobsbridge 
Uh, so 25% of people may have a chance of getting work uh, out of that. And the vast majority of people that do sustain okay. full-time employment may have been uh, employed otherwise, but the reality is the material effects of it is to drive down uh, okay. conditions in workplaces and have free labour. Moira, because you mm -hmm. set up that whole movement about leaving, mm -hmm. what about your reaction to Alan's point that it's not the worst option if it's not forced? Mm, if it's not forced. Mm. Well, we would say that the majority of immigration, and it's difficult to, to mm. define broadly because, you know, there's a lot of complex factors, but a lot of immigration that's happening in Ireland right now is forced. Yeah. And what that leads to is absolutely what we would see as a mental health crisis, that is the family that's left behind, but also the people who are being forced to leave. Because they're, they're living in new situations with people they've never met before, they don't want to be there, and that's not, a, that's not an acceptable way to treat people in our society. And the government is actually actively encouraging this as well. We've seen that with 6,000 people receiving letters from the Department of Social Protection Okay. Advertising jobs abroad. Last word to you, John. There hasn't been a, a street or a family, I'd say, in this in this country that hasn't, um, you know, had uh, forced emigration, and um, and it's not tolerable without a doubt. And um, you know, but all I will say is, you know, the, the government doesn't have all the solutions. We do not have the silver bullet on what needs to be done to ensure that every young person in Ireland has an opportunity. You know, but we do have a number of uh, okay. opportunities there, and the biggest one is is the rollout of the youth guarantee next year, which will ensure okay. that some young people will be given options okay. that aren't currently being given John. options. Alan, more of you and my audience, thank you all very much for chatting to us tonight. David. Tomorrow the campaign group Terminations for Medical Reasons will outline...